results of laparoscopic cholecystectomy have led to the rapid acceptance and widespread use of this surgical technique as the procedure of choice for symptomatic cholelithiasis. In cases of cholodoctylithiasis diagnosed during laparoscopic cholecystectomy, the attempt should be made to remove the calculi during the course of the surgical procedure. Laparoscopic procedures involving instrumental or endoscopic exploration of the common bile duct can be performed making use of cholodichotomy or via the cystic duct. The latter technique prevents complications secondary to opening and closing the common bile duct. The experience of interventional radiologists has demonstrated the efficacy of transhepatic dilatation of Adi sphincter to allow the passage of the calculi into the duodenum. On the basis of these data, we have designed a protocol for treatment of cholodoctylithiasis diagnosed during laparoscopic cholecystectomy with dilatation of Adi sphincter via the cystic duct under laparoscopic and fluoroscopic control. The images reflect the introduction of the catheter to be used for cholangiography via the cystic duct. The diagram shows the procedure to be performed. Through the same catheter used for cholangiography, a Teflon guide wire is inserted from the cystic duct into the duodenum for use throughout the different steps of the procedure. An angioplasty balloon is then passed over the guide wire to the level of the papilla at which point sphincter dilatation is carried out. A Fogarty catheter is inserted and pushed from the cystic duct to allow the passage of the calculi into the duodenum. Six patients with distal cholodoctylophiasis or with distal obstruction were included in this protocol. Interoperative cholangiography revealed a repletion defect five millimeters into the distal common bile duct with moderate dilatation of the common bile duct. In another case, the arrow indicates a distal calculus impeding clearance of the contrast medium into the duodenum. Following cholangiography, a Teflon-coated guide wire is introduced via this catheter. With the aid of an image intensifier, the guide wire can be seen to prevent the obstruction caused by the calculus, which ultimately passes into the duodenum. This guide wire will continue to be used throughout the rest of the procedure. The catheter employed for cholangiography is removed, leaving in place only the Teflon-coated guide wire. The figure illustrates the insertion of the angioplasty catheter into the peritoneal cavity by means of a percutaneous introducer. Directed by the guide wire, it reaches the common bile ductus with no prior dilatation of the cystic duct.
rectifier provides a view of the movement of the catheter and its placement at the level of Adi's sphincter. The length of the balloon is marked by two radio-opaque signs, indicated by the arrows, to facilitate its positioning at the level of Adi's sphincter. The balloon, measuring 10 millimeters in diameter, is then inflated with serum and contrast medium, a step which is assisted by manometric control. The arrow indicates the impression of the sphincter, thus confirming its correct position. The pressure is increased progressively until the impression disappears, signaling the optimal dilatation of the sphincter. The diameter of the balloon will depend on the size of the calculi and of the common bile duct. The contrast is aspirated to empty the balloon and collapse it before its removal via the cystic duct. All these maneuvers are facilitated with the aid of dissection forceps. The technique does not require prior dilatation of the cystic duct and can be carried out in long beaded cystic ducts. Next, with the aid of the guide wire, a Fogarty catheter inflated with contrast medium is introduced, passing from the cystic duct to the duodenum to confirm the optimal sphincter dilatation as it pushes the calculi into the duodenum. Other advantages of this technique are the ease with which it is mastered, the low morbidity rate, and its reasonable financial cost. The maneuver is repeated, and the Fogarty balloon is again slipped from the cystic duct to the duodenum to ensure that the bile duct is free of calculi. In five patients in whom this method was employed, there was no postoperative morbidity, and a two-day hospital stay was sufficient. In the sixth case, the hospital stay was prolonged to six days when asymptomatic hyperamylosemia lasting 48 hours was detected. The mean duration of the procedure was one hour and there were no complications related to the technique. Finally, cholangiography is performed using the same image intensifier to confirm the absence of calculi and the sphincter dilatation is tested by the passage of the contrast medium into the duodenum. The technique ends with the removal of the guide wire and clamping and transection of the cystic duct. No abdominal or transcystic drainage of any type.